Okay, so, Shuffle Puck Cafe. What is this? You're entering a bar, and it seems to be it's full of people. However, these people are not moving. They're just moving their eyes, some of them, mostly. Well, and the robot bartender moves other like lights and buttons stuff. So, everyone's still, looking at you. You just came in, probably from the staircase you see to the right. It's an exit sign. You exit there. You exit through. Okay, here's more things. Only three characters touch the table with their hands. Lexan, the General, and Princess Bejin. All three characters who touch the table are dressed fully in black. Nerwal, we assume, is wearing a black robe, but it's not drawn in actual black pixels, so in terms of real black cl clothes, I think only these three. The table itself is black. Not a surprise, since most of this art is black, but in any case, something is constellating around the shuffle puck table, and it's constellated in black clothes. Princess Bejin has her right shoulder unclothed and her left sho shoulder fully clothed. I'd like to point to a thing. There are two characters at side and side of the bar who follow this pattern. Biff is naked, non-clothed, at least his torso, so visually for us, the viewers, he is unclothed. Nerwal, on the other extreme of the room, is not just clothed, but fully, fully clothed. So clothed, you can't see the body at all. According to the manual, Nerwal is non-corporeal, so we have Biff, a real body, a full body, exposing itself as body, and then Nerwal as non-body, a non-body hidden in clothes. Something hidden, something exposed, something visible, something invisible. This leads me to Princess Bejin again. She winks her eye at you. All other characters who blink their eyes blink them both at the same time, like Visayan Orb. Except, however, Lexan, standing opposite to Bejin. He also blinks one eye individually. So both Bejin and Lexan, not only are they the only two to touch the table side and side of the general, but they both blink their eyes in individual fashion and dressed in black. One idea that comes to my mind is that black could be darkness and therefore shadow or non-being. Nero's face is all black shadow, suggesting maybe that there's... The, 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 that is the meaning of this color theme in this game. Here's another issue, though. The two characters who stand the farthest away from the room, Nerwal and Biff, are also the only two with eyes which are veiled by shadows. Nerwal's eyes occasionally peek through, but mainly it's all darkness, and Biff has also completely shadow eyes, without a pupil visible anywhere. I just realized it's because he's wearing shades, but anyway... So, the two characters who are the farthest away, the extremes of the room, have eyes that signal darkness or non-seeing, whereas the two characters who stand closest to the general are constantly closing one eye at a time, thus leaving one eye open, always to vision, and emphasizing their eyes, so their eyes are, at least one at a time, always open. Not exactly because Bejin does blink sometimes, but generally I think the non-blink motif might, when in contrast to the extreme of the room, mean that the things are being seen, that things are being seen or signaled with the eyes. We understand their eyes. Their blink is directed to us. The shadow eyes of the extreme sides of the room, Biff and Nerwal, are not readable to the player. We can't see what they're saying. Another issue. Here, we have a short character. <laughs> Skip and another, Visign. They're both sort of hidden. Skip is kind of behind Lexan. And Visign Orb, whose manual description mentions his huge eyes and the name Visign, sounds like vision or visible, like visible orb or vision orb. The full name, Visign Orb. So, they're both hidden sort of partially visible, behind something or next to something. So we can't see them that well. They're tiny, so we can't see them that well. And they're also hidden behind things, so we can't see them that well. So a theme of vision starts to emerge. Skip also wears glasses, thus again vision being emphasized. An idea. Both sides of the room are divided into four character groups, with the general at the center. Nerol, Lexan, Skip, and DC3. Princess Bejin, Vinny, Visine, and Biff. 
this last group being weirdly centered around V and B letters. Bejin, Vini, Visein, and Biff. Anyway, the first group would visually place DC3 as the closest character to the general on one side and Bejin on the other. Both of them have decorative elements on their head. Bejin has a sort of third eye jewel on her forehead, like a head veil thing from the 1920s or something, and again, a head thing relating to vision, a third eye. Then DC3 has what ha looks perhaps like an antenna or a light. Other characters have stuff on their heads too. Biff, a bandana, a narrow le cloak, Biff and Nerol again resonating together as the two side-by-side -side end of the bar characters with stuff on their heads. And CD3 and Bijitin close to the center. Stuff on their heads too. This time stuff that resonates a central head element, a central antenna or a central third eye central to the head. Biff even has long hair that look, sort of looks like a cloak is enveloping his face, so he's similar to Nerual in this strange way. Another configuration arises here. Biff is long-haired, Bejin is long-haired, and Nerual is long-cloaked. All three stand apart and divide the room into two halves. Between Nerual and Bejin are, are a small man, Skip, and a beast, Lexan. And between Bejin and Biff are Vinny and Visine, a beast and a tiny man. A beast is usually a signifier for a huge man, a big beast, a big creature. So we have two pairs, big and small, with small being hidden and hard to visualize, and the beast being big and unavoidably seen, seeing. Here we see the general taking center stage, and I wonder why that is. He's in the center of the room and is also on the center of the box art, so somehow he's a main figure. One thing that strikes me is that the manual suggests his wife has just kicked him out of the house for pretending to be someone else. He's pretending to be a revolutionary, or claims he is an intergalactic revolutionary. The second he arrived home, his wife saw him doing that and kicked him out. So his new personality has warranted some sort of a rupture with his romantic life. So this is a story about avoiding something, avoiding the knowledge of this traumatic event. Being kicked out of a relationship, a traumatic memory is here present with him, and he doesn't want to see it, so he doesn't see it. He doesn't, he just looks at the shuffle puck and throws himself entirely into it. The shuffle puck is the game, the game they're playing. However, when they lose, their screen or glass between them loses or crashes, so it destroys the fantasy that they're playing a game. The screen on your computer, what you're using to see and visualize what's happening, to see what's in there, this screen, this glass cracks and breaks whenever you lose. So the game becomes apparent. You stop being able to lose yourself and see it. Biff's name is Raunch, evoking sexual raunchiness, and thus he's naked. He's sort of evoking perhaps some feelings that the general has about his sexual troubles, about his whole sexual ordeal with his romantic life. An issue with time. Time is fucked. Time is supposed to be the future, a futuristic space game about aliens. But the bar just looks like a fucking bar, a bar from that era, the 80s. The exterior location, in the Mac game at least, also doesn't seem futuristic, seems like a normal city. However, the music in the bar is like an old style saloon piano music. So that feels older than the city is supposed to be. It is neither older, nor newer, nor present. It's mixed in some time that's between or unacknowledged. Oh, here's the thing. The two beasts, Lexan and Vinny, are the only two characters who seem to be drinking. Vinny has something in a hand at the table. It looks like a glass. So both animals drink alcohol. Alcohol served to them by the bartender, a robot. So a robot serves drink to animals. Robot and animals seem like the most opposite things possible in the cultural imagination. It's the robot or the video game, perhaps the Mac, which is serving alcohol to these animals, alcohol that might serve as an escape or intoxicating element. Precisely, it might be that once drunk, they're animals, that they're not animals before. Their being beasts might be a result of their escaping from what they're trying to see, 
from the alcohol to prevent seeing the issues. The bar is run by robots. Even the scoreboard is kept by one. So maybe the futuristic theme pres present here has something to do with the structure of the bar. Could we say that the bar is the future, it's robots? But the people inside the bar are old-timey piano and saloon kind of people. And the overall presence is 1980s, present day. When you exit the bar, your screen breaks. So clearly you, the visitor, are exiting the bar by exiting the game. The game is sort of equal to the bar. The game is inside a computer, so it's a robotic bar. But the people inside the bar are dead. They're old-timey because they're from the past, people who are not alive today. They are ghosts, dead. You're seeing a bunch of dead in the bar, but you're seeing them in 1980, your present day, while playing the game as the visitor. You, the visitor, are apparently here because your car or space vehicle broke down. You need to get in touch with the repair crew, but you need a phone to call them first. You head over to the bar. It says, the only thing that stands between you and the telephone is eight galactic misfits, an obsolete droid, and a few friendly games of shufflepuck. It is suggested that if you lose, something bad will happen to you. If you fail, well, you're on your own. And don't say that we didn't warn you. Also, the game suggests this is a dangerous area, so the fight here is a fight between getting a communication device or dying, a phone or death. You are a salesman, actually one of the most important salesmen in the galaxy. So you're a successful man, someone accepted by society, entering a world of people not accepted by society, or that's the way it seems. The pig, the general, stands in the center. You're looking at him directly. He's standing ahead of you. In between you is a screen of glass which cracks when you exit. The pig and the princess are like a Beauty and the Beast duo. The princess with her hand over the pig. It sort of reminds me of the strength card. So it's possibly a sort of moment of resolve in the face of difficulty. Perhaps the visitor is seeing the strength card in front of him. He's seeing the fact that he is now in a difficult situation, but needs inner resolve. He lost his car, he lost his place in society, even if just for a second. During that second, an archetypal space opens up. He's in the face of all odds. He used to be a full, complete being, but now is not. He's in a limbo of hell. But he could become even worse. If he loses, he could lose even more. So he's placing all odds here, and the situation could be very bad. The game is unrealistic in that it suggests that losing the championship could imply a terrible fate, or dying, as if his loss mattered to the people there at the bar. It's as if the people at the bar are personally invested in, whatever, in, in whether he wins or not. He seems like, like a successful salesman who now can't claim to be successful. However, he knows deep inside he is that person. So he claims it to the bar people and suggests to use a phone. He has a double identity. He is a, uh, a loser guy without a car and without a phone. And he's here asking them to use this phone. At the same time, he suggests he is a person with a phone and with a car, even if they can't see it now. So he's sitting in front of the strength card. Now a moment of strength is necessary, of inner resilience. He needs to beat all of these creatures, all these beings inside the bar. If he does, he can communicate with the world that knows him to be a real person, who he knows he, who he, knows he is. He sits in front of the pig. The pig claims to be a successful space revolutionary, a military general. However, he isn't, according to people around him and his wife. So he too is in a similar situation. He's been kicked out of his own world and he knows he's a successful person. He claims to be. He claims to be a successful revolutionary. There are double identities here, looking at double identities, looking at each other. It feels as if one is the other, as if the pig is the visitor and the visitor is the general. The lovely Princess Bejin is said to be romantically linked with the general. 
that this is probably just wishful thinking on his part. That is uh, what the manual says. So, the general has been kicked out of home. But at the same time, he seems to fantasize that he has a lover. It's hard to tell whether he's been kicked out for the general thing, pretending to be a general, or whether it's something else related to his relationship. If she is his lover, then he is fantasizing about her, wishful thinking, as the manual says. She is a part of his imagination. Also, she seems to be able to cast magical spells or do telekinesis. Her third eye is signaled open. It suggests to me, together with the strength caro tarot card tableau, that the general strength, his resolve, is represented as Bejin. She is a spiritual person, so perhaps the spiritual counselor of this game and of the general. Her arm is on his back. Death is in the room. It's hard for me not to see Nerual as a Grim Reaper type. He's said to be bodiless, or at least faceless. He hasn't got a face. He's not hairy. The characters on the other side of the room, the right side, are mostly hairy. Biff, Vinny, and Visine are all hairy. Nexel and DC3 are shiny, scaly, or plain robots with metal. Nerual is without skin or face, so no hair there. A concept of smoothness. General stands there at the center as if he were the boss, but in fact Biff is the champion of this place. He is the naked representative of Raunch of sex. Characters have been thrown out of their homes. You've been thrown out since you have no phone, no way back to your own home. You've been kicked out. You don't accept this though. You, rep you present a, as a successful man who has simply been lost and lost his car, his vehicle. Lex Lexan is rich and has a lot of money sent to him, but the condition is that he can't go back. They don't want him at his planet, his home. General, too. The players are presented in the order of their strength in the manual. This shows us that Bejin is the strongest player after Biff, with Nerual just behind her. This is the order they're played in during the championship. Another issue about double identity. Vinny seems to be a physics student at a prestigious university. However, he wears on his chest what seems to me to be shoulder ammo, suggesting, if so, that he has some role in a military operation. This is curious because it could mean he's pretending to be a physics grad when he is in fact a revolutionary, whereas the general pretends to be a military revolutionary when he is in fact not, as the game says. Nero is a faces, faceless person. When you look at him, there is no face. The face is gone, the manual says. No one knows where. This appears in the form of him imitating the playing style you're playing in. So Nerol becomes you as you play him, mirrors you. He has no face because his face is your face. You're looking at a void, but you're looking at yourself. This might apply to the general, whose story sort of mimics yours. You're looking at someone who seems outside of yourself, and you're not accepting it as yourself, but it is yourself. This person is a revolutionary, someone who is going to change the world completely.